Okay guys, hello and welcome back to Co-Founders Talk from Temi, an international software development company that designs, builds and delivers software for sustainable businesses and promising startups. Guys, you can see today we've got another guest with us, Rebecca Jenkins, founder and director of Argen. Am I saying the, uh, the name correct there, Argen? You are. Perfect. It's Rebecca, R and Jen for Jenkins. Oh, that would make sense. That would, that would make sense, Rebecca. Absolutely. Rebecca, before we get started, I want you to just, um, we're going to find out a little bit more about you first before we go into the world of our Jenny. And, um, but before we do, I want you in a sentence or two, explain what you do at our Jen. Who are you? Well, I absolutely love to share my experience of building an eight-figure business all the mistakes, all the things I got wrong and helping other businesses to grow and increase their revenue, increase their profits and do that as fast as possible without them having to sacrifice any margins or give away any equity. Mm -hmm. Nice. Eight figures. Sounds very nice. Sounds sounds extremely interesting. Um, Okay. So before we get started, I want to jump into the world of everything that you've done at Argen and your past as well. But before we do, Let's get to know you a little bit better. I'm going to throw some quick, fast, rapid questions at you. Um, there will be either yes, no, or a couple of words answers. Yes. So, okay. are you a morning person? Do you mean, am I grumpy in the mornings? <laughs> yeah. No, I'm not grumpy in the mornings. Uh, nice. Okay. Well, what time What time is it like a, a normal get up time for you? Well, it's two very different times. Uh, sort of 6.30, 7 o'clock during the week, uh, working week. And as long as I as possible at the weekend. <laughs> I, I get you. I understand. Okay, cool. Team or independent? Mixture of both. Strong independent street, but love to work with teams. Nice. Okay, interesting. Uh, are you a risk taker? I've put my house on my line for my business. So <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> then. Uh, work-life balance. Is it something you work for? Yes. And I don't always struggle. I continue to work out how to get that right. It's a constant challenge. So I like to think of it as integration there, not to separate out the two. So work-life okay. integration uh-huh. is where I'm heading because I feel that sort of feels easier. Mm-hmm. And still working on it. And still working on it, yeah. After all these years, I'm still working on it. Mm-hmm. I, I haven't received from all of the guests we, which we have on the show, I haven't had like one you know, golden ticket answer to this question yet, which is a, a, a shame for all of us. But I think it's part of the process, isn't it? I think uh, it is. Yeah. Tell us um, networking events. Do you enjoy networking events? Online ones, yes. In person ones, physical ones, not so keen on. Uh huh. Tell me why. Because uh, I, I kind of like online ones because I think they're more specific and more. Uh, I just find them more enjoyable. Whereas if you go to a physical one and you're in a room with a lot of people. And you can very often find these clicky groups. And sometimes they're quite difficult to break into. Mm. And I find you don't get that online networking. Interesting. And you get more to the point a little bit more quickly. Whereas if you're trying to break into a clicky group and people aren't very receptive, I don't think that happens less online. That's actually very true. That's very true. People get to the point a little bit more and they know they're here for a reason, don't they? Yeah. Interesting. Okay. I haven't thought of it that way. Interesting. Have you ever pivoted your business's model? Well, anybody that's not pivoted their business model during COVID, <laughs> tell me. <laughs> yes, uh, most definitely. Because up until COVID, a lot of my work was going into businesses and helping them with the execution of strategy. Uh, and then COVID hit and nobody was in their office, as we all know. So I had to pivot fast. Interesting. Okay, we're going to this a little bit more detail. Tell me, um, short term or long term goals? What do you focus on more? I've got to have the long term in mind. Must have that because that's your motivation to keep going and that's your vision. Then you've got to break it down rapidly into what I do this quarter, this month, this week. Um, Tell me, are you a hands on leader? I think it all depends on the size of business. So in my previous business, which I scaled quite a a size, you can't. You've got to allow your team to be empowered to do the things that they need to do. And it's more about guiding and coaching. And when you've got a smaller business like I have now, then you have to be hands-on and doing the day-to-day things as well. Um, so I think it depends on the company's size to do you, adapt accordingly. Do you enjoy the smaller business more or the bigger business? I actually love both. 
Uh, I think having a bigger team that you in a bigger business where you're supporting and guiding and coaching and helping them is is really a great place to be. And I do that now by working in sort of bigger businesses uh-huh. by guiding and coaching and supporting them. So I feel like I got the best of both worlds. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. And last question in this part. Uh, tell me, are you happy with this year's success so far? Halfway through, are you happy? I am very happy, but I've also learned that you have to be accepting of where you are. And whilst you might have ambitious goals, and I have ambitious goals, and I've not materialized those yet in this current business, I am very happy with progress, and I can see the projection uh, of getting where I'd like to be. And instead of being... I wouldn't use the word stress, but being perhaps a little bit frustrated that it's not gone faster. I've learned over the years, you have to accept where you are and be happy where you are. Interesting. Because otherwise it can get all very frustrating and there's no need for it to be because once you've got the processes and things in place, it will happen. Tell me, with with that in, in mind, out of 10, 1 to 10, on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being the most happy, most um, happy with this year so far, 1 being the least, where would you be? Where would you sit? I'd be about a 7. Uh-huh, good. Let's get into the world of everything that you're doing at RJ because obviously now we've got to know you a little bit better. Give me a, a little bit more. So tell me, where did the idea come from to build RJ? Well, when I sold my uh, previous business and I worked... Um, we sold it to a FTSE 250 business and I worked there for a couple of years and I wanted that corporate experience and we learned so much from that. And then I thought, okay, now I've done that and I've done that for a couple of years, I'm going to take a break, maybe spend more time with my family and with my with, with my children and my husband, etc. And that's great for a certain period of time and I'm revealing a bit about me here that I love to work. Uh, It gives me so much fulfillment that I want to continue to do it and help others. It's just something inside me that I have to recognize. And it was on a holiday that I thought, okay, what are my next steps going to be? Because there's only so much holiday you want or there's only so much time to yourself that you want. I have to do something with this knowledge that I have, this experience that I have. And what's the best way to do that? And it just dawned on me, why don't I help other people that have been in a similar situation, trying to grow a business and helping them to uh, to grow, to be successful, to grow their profits, to give them strategies to, to uh, grow their business, develop their revenue, generate their profits. But do it in a way where we're very aligned on values it's collaboration, it's partnership, because those things are hugely important to me. Rebecca, how did you make that jump though? So you got the idea, you knew you wanted to help other people, but how did that, many people have the idea, not many people put it into practice. How did you put it into practice? I just think a dream without action, I know it sounds cliche, but you've got to put stepping stones to get from A to B. Otherwise it just continues to be a dream and you don't ever make it happen. Mm. And if you fast forward five years or 10 years and you kind of create a vision of what you want it to look like, and then it's about thinking, well, what do I need to do to put it into place? So that's a very practical, very tangible, what are the steps I need to do to make this happen? And I I think you've got to be able, for me, it's seeing that bigger picture and then, well, what do I do today? And that's how I like to help businesses. You're here. And you want to get there. So what you know, what are the steps? Let's get really clear about the activities that you need to do, the structure that you need to have in place to make it happen. Interesting. Okay. Tell me, um, I've done a lot of research about you um on your portfolio and you've mentioned significant profitable accounts such as the body shop, magnet next. Can you share any kind of like the insights that you've got from the strategies you use to help secure these accounts? You secure these accounts and their success. Oh, Matt, thank you for that question because I just love this question. <laughs> really, I love it so much because there's such a story behind it. Mm-hmm. 
Tell us. And I know we don't have oodles of time, but I'll try and condense it into being in logistics, which is what my previous business was, highly competitive, over 100,000 logistics companies in the UK alone, mm-hmm. compared to, say, accountancy, where there's, I think, around about 40,000. Wow. So a lot of mm-hmm. competition. Wanting to grow the business, but wanting to win some big accounts. I wanted to win the body shop, wanted to win next, wanted to win those those companies because they would help the business to grow. And I absolutely like those companies anyway. And the body shop taught me a massive lesson about how you go about securing large accounts. And we were successful in winning the account. Um, but if you do you remember the program Mastermind? Yes. Mm-hmm. You do? Well, if you had put me on mastermind and my specialist subject was the body shop, I would have got 100% right. I might not 100% right on the general knowledge at all. But, you know, if that was my specialist subject, because I knew them inside out. Mm-hmm. I got to know them before we even were um, invited to put in a proposal. So that was big learning number one. If you want to win these corporate accounts, you've got to approach them in a very different way. And you've got to understand what's important to them and how you can help them. And very often, it's a sweet spot of two areas. You either help them to grow their revenue or you help them to reduce their cost. That doesn't mean to say my cost in providing a a distribution service to them. It's the bigger picture. How can you help them reduce their costs overall? So we got invited to Tender, which was fabulous news. Then they told me they were going out to the biggest top six logistics companies in the UK, and that felt like bad news. We won it because we had those insights, and we could, we were able to offer them something very different in their solution. Okay, big learning. Uh-huh. But it didn't stop there, Matt, because after 12 months into a three-year contract, we were going for a meeting. Have I got a minute just to set the scene? Yeah, yeah, sure. sure. Yeah, this okay. is for you. you. You've got the floor. Oh, thank you. Well, mm. their head office is in Littlehampton on the southeast coast. And we were there for a nine o'clock meeting. Obviously, we stopped for a coffee on the way and had a chat. And this is after first 12 months, we had delivered all of Body Shop's uh, requirements during the peak of Christmas, you know, all these hampers and gift packs and everything else. Plus, Body Shop were opening still hundreds of stores in the year, and we just done everything. So I was expecting this massive pat on the back, not just for me, for my team as well. I thought it's going to be a great meeting. It's going to be a breeze. Look what we've done. Oh, look at it. But in, as we walked into the meeting, I just sensed they weren't as jovial as they might have been, or as I was expecting them to be. And they said, "Yeah, great. We've done all of these things. The team's been amazing." But you are boring. And I had no idea what they meant. How do you respond? <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I, what do you mean? And they said, well, we're not really sure. They're doing a great job, but it's boring. It's not going anywhere. And you know, you've got a couple of weeks to think about what you do. And this is a multi-million pound contract with a brilliant client that I absolutely love and highly profitable. So, and it put us on the map, you know, here's a small logistics business winning a, one of the most prestigious contracts of the year in logistics. And now I'm being told we're boring. If we don't buck our ideas up, not knowing what they meant, we may not keep the contract. Think of the damaged reputation to that, Mm -hmm. you know, my big six would be circling Mm -hmm. to get their hands on it. And just to prove that Body Shop had made a mistake and needed a big player to, uh, to do it and nobody would believe me would they look we've done everything okay but we still lost the contract strange yeah yeah nobody would get it would they no, it doesn't make sense no. so, so this was a big moment for me not you know in leadership as well because i had to go back to my team and we had i had to say i don't know what to do i don't have the answers whereas up until that point i thought that i had to have all the answers and I, I get now that that's wrong, and I get at the time that that was wrong, but that was kind of how I thought at that time. Um, we had brainstorming session after brainstorming session with the team, knowing that we had a deadline to go back to body shop in a couple of weeks. So what the heck were we going to do? I didn't, yeah, I still didn't have any ideas. 
anyway, in just being open with the team, I learned that when you empower your team and encourage them to help you, they want to help you. They want to find a way forward. And it was uh, a member of the team that said, hey, we're asking the wrong question. And the question we kept asking was, how do we provide a better distribution service to body shop? Is it more depots, more drivers, more trucks, different staging points? You know, what those were the, we were thinking within the realm of what we do for them now. And what we weren't asking was, how could we be more strategically aligned to what's important to the body shop? Mm. Wow, such a big lesson. But the best lesson ever for me in business. Wow. Because when we started to think like that, we were able to come up with, if you think about it, Matt, you'll probably have the answer to this yourself. If we think about what's important to body shop and still important to them today. Money. Money, but also the environment, not testing yeah. on animals. You know, Anita Roddick, who started the business, very entrepreneurial, but it was all around not harming the environment. She was so far ahead of her time. Sadly, she's a late dame, Anita Roddick. She's no longer with us. But we were here, here we were with the fleet of trucks, diesel fumes belching out black smoke. I mean, that's a slight exaggeration, but you get the principle of it. And they're about the environment. So there was a big disconnect there. So were they hinting to this? Were they trying to put you? They weren't. Not to that specifically, but what they were hinting to was you can do better than just be our logistics provider, but we don't know what that is. Although they didn't use those words. If they'd used those words, it would have been helpful. We had to figure that out ourselves. But, you know, sometimes when you have to figure these things out yourself, it's a better learning. So once a penny dropped on that, and these ideas kept coming up, and we thought, why don't we go back to Body Shop and say, we will we will develop the most environmentally sound truck to do your distribution. Uh-huh. Now, we didn't know how to do that. We weren't a truck manufacturer. Um, but this is when I really learned about collaboration and the importance of aligning to what your client's bigger goals, bigger needs are. Uh, we made that happen and we retained that body shop contract for 15 plus years. Wow. Amazing. So you became a mind reader and a fortune teller. And go <laughs> say what they wanted. Well, don't go too far. Like, <laughs> absolutely not. But back to your original question, if you want to win big accounts, and small businesses can win big corporate accounts. And the best way to do it is to lead with insights mm-hmm. and think about the transformation you're going to create for that company and then have a discussion with them about it. Amazing. Okay. Well, that is a huge lesson, which for our listeners as well. Um, okay. Tell me in regards of doing this, how did your team tackle this? So you were saying that obviously this is where you had to sit down. You had the answers before and you got to a point where you didn't have the answers anymore. How did your team get to this point where, um, was it just brainstorming sessions? Was it, um, how did you make from A to B? We're actually not even A to B. There's no B. There's A to wherever you need to be. How did you get that? We just had a series almost daily of sessions to say, okay, this is the, the challenge. Go away and think about it. Come back tomorrow. Let's share ideas. Nothing is, we can talk about anything. Uh-huh. Um, but, but just over... Those sessions, we just began to pick up different thoughts. And one person had this most amazing idea. I don't think they could have got to that idea without those sessions, without that feeling of we're all in this together. We've got a a timeline. We don't want to lose this contract. Let's support each other. Let's empower each other. Let's just work together to uh, see what we can come up with. So this was the time when people were in the office. Yeah, there was lots of brainstorming yeah. sessions going on. Yeah. Um, now, obviously, you're saying that you prefer online sessions as well. I don't know how often you go and, and meet in the office and stuff. Do you think this is something that we are lacking now since COVID where we are online? You can't jump on the call and just brainstorm. You go onto a quiz we said at the beginning and it's very specific. Is this going to be something that we lack now? 
it's such a good point, Matt. It's a really, really good point. I think there probably is a case for getting together um, every now and again to just have that personal engagement and those spark of ideas. Now, I've been doing lots of um, board meetings online and I thought they worked perfectly well. Great, we don't need to travel. And then we had one meeting where we got together in person and it was absolutely amazing. And so I think sometimes we forget about what we can lose from these kind of digital meetings, although I think they are amazing. We've got to bring in that human contact and that human engagement as well. That water cooler by the drinks machine, um, drinks yeah. out a kind of moment. Tell me, in regards to Arjun, how did you bring that lesson into what you're doing now at Arjun? Well, I help businesses to win big accounts by using that approach. It's now a framework called Vital. Uh -huh. And I help companies to go through that process, that Vital methodology, to be able to, well, one, be ready to win big accounts because not every business is ready for it. So if a company wants to win them, they've got to get themselves structured and ready and in place for it. Uh -huh. And then once they've got that, then we move into okay, let's target these companies that you would really like to have as your clients and we do the research on that and then we take it from there. But very often businesses need you know, new business now. Larger accounts will take time, so 12, 18, even 24 months. Uh -huh. So you've got to have a strategy for that alongside needing revenue growth now. So we've, we bring the two together. Okay. How are you uh, using technology now? Obviously, going forward in the future, how are you using and going to plan to use even more so technology? Uh, I think that the opportunities are absolutely endless. So I use ChatGPT, for example, like everybody else seems to be, um. uh, for ideas on content. I use automation in specific areas such as um, for LinkedIn. So instead of sending out a message to every person, please connect, you can use some automation to help with that. Uh, it's meant to be saving time, isn't it? I haven't Absolutely. Why? Succeeded on that <laughs> yet. Okay. But I did see this amazing post on LinkedIn, 10 ways to save 10 hours a week. So I've listed down all the apps and I'm going to give that a go. You know, I think it, it is that kind of phase where we have to learn how to use it, which takes more time. And then after that, it will free up, free up so many, much more time for other activities. So the life just becomes more compact, obviously, but a lot of their more success is a lot easier to, to achieve. Okay. Rebecca, um, obviously on our podcast here today, uh, you've also got your own podcast. So uh, business owner, and also you've managed to find time to um, create your podcast. Tell me a little bit about your podcast, what kind of guests you invite on and why uh, it's important for you. Oh, I've learned so much from the podcast. I just can't tell you how much. Um, I started the podcast in lockdown with my son. Uh, he's in his early 20s and he's stepping into leadership. I'm interested in learning. I mean, stepping into leadership. We are all leaders, so that's probably the wrong terminology, but he, it was that desire to learn more about modern leadership and to bring in guests who would just willingly share their story and their experience of leadership, the highs and the lows, and inspire others to accept that we are all leaders in our own right. It doesn't have to be a job title. Yeah, we've we've just learned so much from it. I've been inspired by it. I've had amazing guests on it. Um tell me about that. Tell me um so I always say that I've got front row seat to the minds of amazing people. Yeah. What has been like the moment that comes to your mind straight away that you have learned from one of the guests, which you now use in your company or in your daily life? Do you know, I think one of the things for me, it's okay to say you're a heart-centered leader. Uh -huh. And I would never have used that language. In Heart-centered. What does that mean? That you lead with... If your heart. Yeah, lead with your heart. You are... Um, you're empathetic. 
your very strong emotional intelligence, your thinking about the people in your business. It's not a control and command type leadership style. Um, you take the time to get to know your people as individuals. I've always laughed at these programs where they say the MD or the chief exec goes to the um, to the shop floor. Uh huh. And I've, you should be doing that anyway. You, mm -hmm. if, unless you know how your team are on the shop floor, how can you support them? How can you make their world better? How can you make your business environment better? But there's a whole series of programs around that. And so I think I've learned that it's okay to say I'm a heart-centered leader, which I wouldn't have said 10 years ago. But I've, I've always been very focused on the people. It's a collaboration. It's a working together. It's a partnership. But I would never have used those words. Perhaps they felt too soft. But maybe. No, maybe. Okay. Um, tell me about your, um, from the podcast, from what you've heard from the speakers and the leaders from the world, what have been the kind of the most common challenge that every one of them seems to face? And I mean, for for example, if we can tell our listeners right now uh, some useful advice as to how they don't need to make the same mistakes which all of our listeners, your listeners have gone through, what would they be? There is one that stands out a mile, and yep. that is... Don't delay in making decisions about people in your business that aren't the right fit. Interesting. Everybody says that. Whether they say it on the podcast or afterwards, they all say it. And I can understand why, because when you've got a team, you want them to be successful and you give people time to change and improve. But in your heart, you might know it's never going to work out. And then you think, well, am I being fair to this individual? Because I know it's not going to work out. Why don't we have that difficult conversation now and decide on how we're going to address this? And maybe that means move on from the business. And everybody says that. I left it too long. Uh -huh. So I think the big lesson is uh, to take your time over recruiting the right people. But if it's not a good fit, yes. say goodbye fast. But with, do it with compassion, do it with care. Um, it's a very difficult thing to do though, isn't it though? Because uh, a lot of the time people, I mean, I've heard that quite a lot from the guys on this podcast as well, but they always give one more chance, just one more yeah. chance. Maybe things will change, but it's a very difficult thing just to draw the line. And especially at the beginning, it's so important at the beginning, because obviously those people in your company at the beginning are those which are paving the way for the future. Okay. Um, tell me uh, just a few more questions. What has been the most difficult challenge you have faced this year? I think I'm still working on that. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, I think it's getting my message absolutely right for my target clients. And I struggle with this because I love to work with both big organizations, helping them to grow their key accounts. But I also love working with smaller businesses, helping them to grow, increase their profits, tackle some of those difficult things that we've just talked about, helping them and supporting them through that, giving them a different perspective. And therefore, sometimes I think my message is a little bit diluted. So I continue to work on that, Matt. Mm -hmm. And I don't think I've got it right just yet. Is this something, obviously, you want to make this message, you want to uh, decide this message as soon as possible, but have you put a kind of time on when you want to achieve this? Is it in kind of, does it need to be now or is it, and you know what I'll figure out this year? I'll figure it out this year and I get to a point where I think I have figured it out uh -huh. and then I think it's not quite right. So it's that continual refinement uh -huh. and I think that doesn't matter for me. It's not. You know, I will continue to evolve it. I will continue to think and reflect on it. It's probably, I don't know, 80% there. Just needs some tweaks. It needs uh, to be further refined. But I think that's a great way to approach life. It's true. Yeah, I mean, you used a great word for it there. Evolve. Yeah, instead yeah. of change it, evolve it for sure. Okay. And the last question, we were speaking about um, a lot of brainstorming sessions and how important these brainstorming sessions are. If you were to sit down, uh, with three people, dead or alive, you know, this question, 
around a, um, around a, a round table to push your business forward. Who would you invite and why? Well, without doubt, the late Damon Eater Roddick would be number one guest. I think she's was amazing. Um, who else would I have? Oh, my goodness, Matt, this is where I feel on the spot now. I can't think of anybody. <laughs> well, I can, actually. I think it would be Tony Robbins would be second. He's had an amazing impact on my life. Um, so he would be second. I mean, just extraordinary individual. And third would be, um, I can't think of a third person. It's a tough question to put you in the spot. <laughs> it's a tough one. I I think, you know, I can't believe how resilient Nelson Mandela was. How did he manage all that time incarcerated? How did he deal with that? Mm-hmm. And learning from his resilience... I think I always knew you're resilient, but learning from that would be phenomenal. That's interesting. That's the, I've only asked this question, I think, three times, and that's the second time I've got Nelson Mandela. Oh, wow. So interesting. Okay, uh, Rebecca, thank you so much for coming on the show today. It's been amazing to pick your brain, learn everything about you, what you're doing and what you've done um, and how uh, Arjun is going to develop in the future. I wish you all the luck and I hope maybe uh, in a years time or so we will um get in contact again and see it moving forwards and you having your message um clear uh and uh yeah definitely thank you for coming on you've asked amazing questions matt thank you so much thank you rebecca it's been amazing to have you on obviously we'll cut this bit um it's been amazing to have you on honestly uh, it's the first time i've actually had a british person on with me uh so that's <gasps> that's a new experience for me it's very nice to be here with another uh, british person